I'm Nick Gebelt. I'm a bankruptcy attorney here in Whittier, California, and I practice bankruptcy throughout the Central District of California. I also do tax debt resolution. In a previous video, I discussed briefly the kinds of debts that are not dischargeable in a Chapter 7 bankruptcy. One of those categories of non-dischargeable debt was debts incurred through fraud. In this video, I'd like to explore that a little bit further. Now, fraud is a little tricky in bankruptcy, in part because unlike just in daily life, we have two independent definitions of fraud. The first probably captures what came up in your mind when you heard me use the word fraud. Because I think on a visceral level, this is the way most people think of fraud. You might not have had as precise a definition as I'm going to give, but this is the general understanding. A debt's incurred through fraud if at the time you incur it, you make a material misrepresentation. You lie. And that induces a creditor or a lender to extend credit or lend money to you, and that entity wouldn't have done so but for that lie. I'm pleased to report that that particular problem, debt, is generally not a problem in bankruptcy because I think most people are trying to be straight shooters and sometimes things conspire against the best laid plans of mice and men. Maybe there's a, a job loss, a, a health care catastrophe, a familial upheaval. But at least you know what that first definition is all about. It's the second definition that creates problems, in part because we don't really use the word fraud in common parlance this way. It's captured by a slogan, a debt's incurred through fraud if at the time you incur it. You have no intention of ever repaying the debt. All right, I think it's pretty clear we've got a problem with that definition. How do you know what another person intends? It's not like we can read people's minds, and the fact is the bankruptcy court doesn't have a team of Vulcans who can do mind melds and read your thoughts. So, the bankruptcy code, in essence, admits that we can't read people's minds, and it tacitly instructs the judge to look for certain kinds of behavior, which, if present, give rise to a presumption that you didn't intend to repay the debt, regardless of what you say to the contrary. The main focus of this analysis is twofold. One, did you have a reasonable expectation when you incurred the debt that you'd eventually be able to repay the debt? And two, the debt's very recent. Well, with respect to that first one, did you have a reasonable expectation? Imagine you just went out and incurred $50,000 worth of debt. Well, if you did that while you were unemployed, unless you were a very high earner that just happened to be in between high-paying jobs, a good case could be made that you really didn't intend to repay the debt when you incurred it because you didn't have a reasonable expectation that you would eventually be able to repay the debt. The other one, though, the relatively recent debt, is really where most of the action is. So the image of the guy that's going to go rack up a whole bunch of debt and shortly thereafter he's going to file for bankruptcy protection. That one's problematic. Well, how recent is too recent? It's a little problematic there too, determining how recent is too recent. It does help to know what happens after we file the bankruptcy papers to know number one, what's at stake, and number two, what if any prophylactic measures we can take to address the problem. So when we file the papers, the bankruptcy court is going to send notices out to each of your creditors telling them of the filing. The creditor gets the notice, shoots it down, down to its legal department, and somebody down there is going to bring up your account and their internal records and ask, could we convince the bankruptcy judge assigned to this case to declare this debt to be non-dischargeable? If they think the answer is yes, they're going to appeal to two pieces of ammunition when they file a special kind of a lawsuit in the bankruptcy court called an adversary proceeding. The first piece of ammunition, Your Honor, this debtor can't possibly have intended to repay me when she incurred the debt, because look at how little time passed from the day she incurred the debt until the day she filed her bankruptcy papers. If that's a problem, we'd like to age the debt a bit. Let's let some water pass under the bridge before we file. 
the second piece of ammunition, a failure to make post-debt incurrence payments on the debt. Your Honor, this debtor can't possibly have intended to repay me when he incurred the debt because he never made any payments after he incurred the debt. If that's a problem, we'd like to have you make a few bare minimum payments. Now, we're not trying to make headway on the principle. We're just trying to get a track record of trying to pay something. Then, when enough payments have been made, enough time has passed, we've greatly reduced the likelihood of problems, and then we file the bankruptcy papers. So the obvious questions are, well, how much time? How many payments? And that's really where it gets to be murky. What I can tell you is it's based on three factors. Number one, the identity of the creditor. Some creditors are more aggressive than other creditors, so if we're dealing with an aggressive creditor, we may need to wait more time and have more bare minimum payments than if it's a less aggressive creditor. The second factor that comes up is, what'd you buy? My kids were hungry, they needed food. My children were sick, they needed medicine. This is going to be viewed very sympathetically because these are necessities of life. But you went to the spa to be pampered because you're worth it. Or you took a cruise because you deserved it. Well, it's very nice for you, but you can be sure that the creditor is going to object and the judge will side with the creditor. So if it's a luxury good or service, we're going to need more time and more bare minimum payments than if it's a necessity of life. The third factor that comes up is, how did you incur the debt? Was it just a gradual accretion over time, or were the big surges? Big surges mean we need more time. I've scratched the surface on this. As you may imagine, there's a lot of case law discussing this particular problem. So if you'd like to talk further, give me a call. I can be reached at 562 777 9159